You know what I hate about this is it's always the wrong group of people. And what I mean by that is that I don't have to tell Noah or Kian or Carl Chapman or Joe about uh, why law needs to change and the, the things that need to change. I, Tanina does not need to hear that. The people that need to hear that didn't come today, right? Uh, you, you people are already on the team, and that's awesome. I, I, I cannot believe that we are in a standing room only environment. Uh, I was kidding around with Roland before things started today that, you know, five years ago, the panelists would have outnumbered the audience. Uh, and yes, I wish there were more chairs, but it's amazing. It's just amazing to see so many people. So listen, I, I, I'm not going to try to convince you that there are problems with our current legal system. You're here because you already know that. But I do want to talk to you about something that I think you may not know about. And even if you do know about it, I think you'll find useful, potentially explosively useful. And I'm going to ask you at the very end of this for a favor. So hopefully, hopefully, this will be something of interest. And hopefully, hopefully, this is something that you will carry back to wherever you came from. So uh, me, I'm Eddie Hartman. Uh, I just taught last semester on this and, and basically on all of you at Yale University, uh, jointly between the law school and the School of Management. I'll be teaching next term uh, here at Stanford uh, in a, what, what Roland and I are hoping will be sort of like a dual hemisphere thing. We're teaching sort of two sides of the same thing. Uh, incredibly thrilled to do so, and I'm the founder of a company called LegalZoom, which uh, incorporates about one in four businesses in places like California, about one in nine across the country. You've probably seen our ads. Sorry about that. Uh, but again, you know, I just want to say again how incredibly thrilled I am to have everybody in the audience today. I also want to tell you, if you're not aware, that right now in America, you cannot own a stake in a law firm unless you're a lawyer. I, I, I'm always surprised people don't know that I have shares in IBM, I have shares in Microsoft, uh, because my grandmother gave them to me when I was 13. But I do not have shares in, in you know, uh, Baker McKenzie or shares in Paul Weiss because it's, it's not legal for a non-lawyer. Now, actually, I am a lawyer, but the, the point is that non-lawyer ownership is prohibited. It's sort of one of the core things. And I think it's high time that we question this and begin to ask ourselves, why is that? Now, let's look at other countries. So here's a quick history. Uh, New South Wales, which is, uh, if you are not from Australia, is not part of Australia in 2001 began to permit non-lawyer ownership of law firms. In 2003, Parliament commissioned Sir David Clementi, who is not a lawyer, he ran a, a major insurance concern. Uh, and they said, take a look at access to justice in the UK and tell us what you think. Now, the UK doesn't have the same high bar against, a uh, high regulatory bar uh, against flexible legal services and delivery of legal help that we have here. You know, in the US, many states have created a felony for unauthorized practice of law. You can spend a year in jail in California for a second offense of UPL. In the UK, they don't have that concept. But nevertheless, David Clementi took a look at the legal industry and said, we ought to have these goals. And he ticked them off. As a profession, as, a, as, a, as an industry, law ought to have these goals, and we are not hitting these goals. And he said, in part, a lot of it comes from poor business practices. Uh, and then, and it's a 90-page, really dense report, but it's full of these great little chestnuts like this one. If certain lawyers continue to reject the notion that they are in business, such complaints will continue until they are indeed out of business. He's, you know, so true, right? If we don't think about what we do and the fact that it is an industry and it is a business, uh, increasingly we'll lose our hold on, on the public. So typical uh, British bureaucracy, they look at this. By 2007, the uh, Parliament passes an act, Legal Services Act, uh, which actually uh, should be 2011, because that's when it actually went into effect, again, British bureaucracy, and actually 2012, which is when the first ABS is the first non-lawyer-owned law firms began to be formed. Now, the American Bar Association took a hard look at this in 2012. Uh, they reviewed it, they, they thought about the facts, and they said, nah. We're fine. We're OK. We don't, we don't need this non-lawyer ownership stuff. In fact, our resolution is going to be not merely that we don't want it, but that we should stop talking about it. 
Uh, nevertheless, in uh, 2016, a brave group from the ABA actually managed to pass Resolution 105, which, as Clementi did in 2003, set forth some goals. Why is this so dangerous? Because when we set forth goals, we have to ask ourselves, are we hitting those goals as a profession, as an industry? And if we're not, what are we going to do about it? So let me tell you what's actually going on in the UK. What is an alternative business structure? It's a law firm. It does have additional regulatory oversight. So you have to file additional reports with the solicitor's regulatory authority. You have to hire executives who are just there for compliance purposes, a chief legal officer, essentially, a chief financial officer. But it allows non-lawyers to invest, and it rewards that investment with ownership, with equity. So a non-lawyer can actually have a stake. Now, wh why is this so important? Why am I up here talking about this? Uh, why is this an important issue to me? These are, I think, four very important inventions. You've got air travel, you've got cellular, um, you know, mobile, mobile cellular technology, you've got the printing press down there, uh, the transistor, which makes so many things important. What do these things have in common? Or if that doesn't immediately strike you as obvious, what do these things have in common, right? These are some of the most important inventions. These are some of the things that define us as a civilization and have moved us forward. And if you're not getting it, none of these were invented by lawyers. Which is not to say that lawyers aren't amazing people. I am a lawyer, right? But, but we got to give some credit to the idea that non-lawyers have brains. I mean, they gave us microscopes and, and transistors and penicillin. And, you know, if you look at the lower, what is that, the lower right, uh, uh, you know, Linux or the x-ray, depending upon which way you take that one. But the point is, major things that have advanced us as a society. So, you know, I firmly believe, as Suskin said, that law no more exists to enrich lawyers than medicine exists to enrich doctors. You know, medicine exists because illness is a fact and health is a fact and society is enriched when we pursue it and that is the purpose of medicine, not to provide salaries for doctors. But by extending that logic, I thought to myself, what would happen if we applied the same regulatory bars in medicine as we have in law. What if we said, you know what, we can allow non-doctor ownership of healthcare practices. Okay, so these are the top 40 companies from the Fortune 500. Uh, these are the ones that just say all we do is healthcare, right? So you've got Cardinal Health and McKesson and United Health Group and so forth. Uh, and then I, I thought about it as like, you know, some of the companies like Microsoft, uh, GE produces, you know, uh, medical uh, imaging devices and, you know, very, very high impact technology. Uh, and Google is working on keeping us all alive forever with genetics. So let's actually look at the full sweep. If we take all the companies that say, yes, healthcare is all I do, or healthcare is a deep part of what I do. You know, I can go to, for example, my CVS, and I can go to the counter of the pharmacy there. And a person standing there will tell me what drugs I need, how they will interact with each other, how I should take them, what to recommend them. Things that in, if, if you did the legal equivalent, if you did the legal equivalent of a flu shot that I could get at CVS, you'd be going to jail unless that was being done by a law firm, right? If that, that's clearly unauthorized practice of, of law, but the analogous activity in medicine is certainly permitted and is a big part, again, of what these firms do. So what would happen if we only looked at the ones that are run by doctors or were started by doctors, you'd have this. All of them are run by non-doctors. In fact, all of them were started by non-doctors. And you may think I'm gaming it. You may say, well, okay, but you know, Johnson & Johnson, eh. okay, how about hospitals? These are the six largest hospital chains. None of them, not one of them is run by a doctor. Not one of them is run by somebody with an MD. How about drugs? Same story. These are the largest drug firms. So what would happen if you said, well, no, 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 non-doctors non cannot own a healthcare practice. You'd have millions of people dead. You'd have probably actually billions of lives shortened. I would not be here. I would be. I, I, my, my, I'm alive today because of pharma. My dad um, you know, is, is just survived a, a, a terrible cancer in January. Uh, uh, Josh Becker's at the back of the room, his dad went through something similar. Uh, without the non-lawyer contribution, the non-doctor contribution to healthcare, uh, 
that would not be possible. Millions of people would be dead, millions of lives would be cheapened, and beyond that, if you just want to think about numbers, just these companies alone would wipe 2.5 trillion off the books. That's 14% of GDP, 5 million jobs. It is so important to have non-doctors participating in medicine, and yet, no matter how much we look at this, no matter you know, how clear an alternative world non-lawyer participation in legal services would provide, we continue to say no in this country. And here are the reasons why. So the ABA actually does have a resolution out. There, it was a you know, call for response. And they said, on the opposing view, these are why people say it would be too dangerous to have non-lawyers own a law firm. It would erode our professional ethics. We would have big concerns about attorney-client privilege. And ultimately, we do not think that the benefits that you're talking about would actually emerge. OK. So we know that attorneys currently you know, are trained, heavily trained in professional responsibility. I do not know why suddenly going to work at a different place would make us forget our duties, would forget our, you know, forget our training. But we know that right now it's happening. You know, we have GCs, we have, uh, you know, lawyers going to work for insurance corporations. They're not suddenly forgetting their ethics. We have uh, multidisciplinary practices where lawyers work hand in glove with accountants. They're not forgetting their ethics. It, I think the big concern, we all know, the, the elephant in the room, is the concern is that, you know, those business people with their greed for profits will erode our professional responsibility, the primacy of the, of the client. And Jim Sandeman talked about this earlier. This is how we rank ourselves as a profession. We rank ourselves by profits per equity partner. Let's think about what this does for our appetite to invest when it has to come right out of our profits. We know that if our profits dip, we go down on this ranking, it becomes harder to attract new associates. And there's also a, a real moral hazard here because that money has to come right out of our pockets. And so, are we doing the right thing by our clients in not investing and preferring profits which boost our ranking? I think the answer to that is pretty clear. But in, in summary on this slide, you cannot corrupt a profession's ethics by introducing a profit motive, thanks for the chuckle, Adam, when that profit motive is already how we rank ourselves. What about attorney-client privilege? Well, we know that right now attorneys work with non-attorneys. Uh, and if we want to draw the parallel from medicine, we know that doctors have a confidentiality arrangement with their patients. And yet, as I just showed you, the majority of doctors in this country work for organizations that are run by non-doctors. So why in the world would we think that attorney-client confidentiality would suddenly vanish just because a lawyer was working for an organization run by a non-lawyer? But I think, you know, that question of outcome is the big one here. And how do we motivate an outcome? Raise your hand if you know someone who's a partner of a law firm or someone who's on a partnership track or someone who would like, you know, maybe if you're a law student, would like to be on a partnership track. Please raise your hands right now. Okay. We know that the, par the partnership track, what is it there for? Well, it attracts new talent. It retains talent. Saul Goodman, ladies and gentlemen. And it motivates talent, right? It, mo it motivates the lawyers to work those long, hard hours. But ultimately, the real reason we have a partnership track at law firms is because it creates partners. The partners who are going to be the heart and soul of the firm, who are going to guide that firm, who are going to be really what that firm is into the next generation. So who are we excluding here? These smart people that brought you these 16 fairly useful things like penicillin, the microscope, and so forth, they're not on a partnership track. We're not trying hard to attract them, retain them, motivate them. And even if you found an incredibly talented non-lawyer, an incredibly talented technologist, marketing executive, a logistics expert who is willing to work for a law firm, they would not have a seat at the table. And if you've ever worked at a law firm, you know that if you don't have a seat at the table, you're not really in a position to direct that law firm toward the future. You don't really have a vote in how things are going to be done, and that is why Major law firms, and I will not name names, but I will say several of the ones that were on that previous slide about you know, bringing home $5 million a year, many of those law firms are still running on Lotus Notes and Word Perfect. And is that the best thing for our clients, really? So 
what would we do differently if we could actually attract, retain, motivate great non-lawyer professionals? Marketers could change the access to justice question. We know from the work of Rebecca Sandifer that the majority of the problem with non-consumption, with people not turning to lawyers, is that they don't recognize that they have a legal problem or they don't understand how to take care of it. They don't know a lawyer that they can approach or they're simply unaware. That is where we bring in great marketers. This is what we do in healthcare. When there's a public health issue, we market. And it is effective, provably effective, but we don't have those kind of marketers at law firms. And if we finally did that, by the way, and took that non-consumption rate from 92%, which it is today, and brought it down, if we took consumption from 8%, which it is today, to, I don't know, 25% or 50%, if 50% of people facing a serious legal problem used a lawyer, we wouldn't have enough lawyers. You know, right now, of course, unemployment's a big problem. It sure wouldn't be if people were using lawyers when they needed to. Then we would need great operations people who could do more with less, who could help us to be more effective. And what about the problem in rural communities that have no lawyers? That's where logistics people could come in. And I don't need to tell you that technology people, like many of you, could make law more convenient and more accessible. And of course, non-lawyers, who are trained in law at a lower level, like the triple LT suggested by Paul Littlewood, could help a great deal here as well. But in the words of the sage, if you don't believe me, just watch. So we're doing it. We uh, acquired a law firm in the UK. We finally got our ABS license in January of 2015, and we bought a law firm. And I cannot tell you how pleased the partners in this and the, the, the lawyers in this 200-year-old British firm were to discover that they'd been purchased by a group of Americans, including me. <laughs> uh, that's some of them up there. They're just outside of Leeds, and the primary work that they do is conveyancing, and if you don't speak British, that's uh, buying a house, essentially. Uh, and this is the paperwork. This is the actual paperwork required for one section of conveyancing, and that gentleman is holding a beer. Uh, which, which you would probably want to do too if you were looking at filling out all that paperwork. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to make that paperwork disappear. The lawyers are still going to do what lawyers do. They still got their primary duty to the client. They still are going to operate in the way that they have. But we have got our chief operating officer, who's a former captain in the Green Beret, who's been leading teams of 250 men since he was 21 years of age, out there eliminating that paper, leveraging our eight-figure investment in technology to make things better. Now, some people say non-lawyers are going to erode quality. I, I will take that action. If anybody wants to bet, I'm telling you, telling you here today, quality is going to go up, errors are going to go down, cost is going to go down, and we'll see customer satisfaction increase. If anybody doesn't believe me, please put your money where your mouth is. This to me is the Doc Hollywood lesson, or as my wife reminded me this morning, this is the Downton Abbey lesson. Medical care in a small doctor's office is fine, but where's the hospital? If there's a better alternative that provides greater survivability, it is malpractice in medicine not to turn to it. We know that there's a better alternative out there. We know that we could create one. We know that we could involve non-lawyers. And the gap is not geographic as it was in Downton Abbey, but, but one of progress, right, of, of actually involving technologists, involving operations people, marketers, to tackle access to justice. It's there to not do it instead of the make-believe, uh, figmentary specter of non-lawyers eroding our ethical duties. I think we have a real ethical failure in not turning to the smack-you-in-the-face reality of failing to work with non-lawyers to produce a better outcome. So, you know, Lord uh, Worthington said, uh, law is too important to be left to lawyers. I disagree, but I do think it's too important to be left to lawyers alone. I think it has to start with us. I'm way out of time. Thank you, Nicole. Please follow me on Twitter. If you're a student at Stanford, please take my class. We're going to get a petition together. Please stand with us. We think this is the right way forward, and thank you.